look past Brad Glenn's one year at Virginia Tech, and I'll tell you why I now think he's a solid hire to be the Bearcats' offensive coordinator. Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Final day of February. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. It's free and available everywhere that you get your podcasts, including right here on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe to our Lockdown Bearcats YouTube channel. You can also follow it to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. My name is Alex Frank, your host each and every day right here on Lockdown Bearcats. We are, of course, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. So Brad and Glenn, excuse me if my allergies are bad during this episode, but Brad Glenn, there's one thing I like about him. It's that he has worked with quarterbacks, yes, a lot of them at the FCS level or at the G5 level, but he has made several quarterbacks over the years really good and great, most notably Armani Edwards at Appalachian State. And his work with quarterbacks over the years and, and at his stops can, applied, can be applied specifically to quarterbacks like Evan Prater at Cincinnati. I said it earlier this offseason. Evan Prater is the most important player on this Bearcats team. It's not Emory Jones. It's not Ben Bryant. It's not Deshaun Pace. It's not whoever else you want to mention. Evan Prater is the most important player on this team. Time is running out on him as a Bearcat. It almost feels like maybe, and I've thought about this, it's like in the quarterback battle, where does he stand? It can almost feel like, He's an afterthought, but the truth is he's not because Evan Prater is the highest rated recruit in the 24-7 sports era for Cincinnati Bearcats football to commit to Cincinnati, but he needs to take the next steps to be a effective starting quarterback in college football. The last three years for Evan Prater have felt like a honeymoon phase. But now, we know the work he needs to do. We've seen it in two starts. Two starts is enough to know, okay, we think he's this, but we need him to be this. There's obviously excitement of what Emory Jones can do under Brad Glenn and Scott Satterfield. He has the skill set to do it. But Evan Prater does too. And for what it's worth, Evan Prater is not the most just the most important player this year. He's also the most important player going into 2024 if he stays. And that's why right now he is. Because if he transfers, if after the spring, the same things are being said about Evan Prater on this podcast, it wouldn't shock me if he transferred. And it's going to be hard for him to do that. Because he's a Cincinnati kid, he can be viewed as a hometown hero, and unfortunately his time as a Bearcat, if he does transfer, really can be viewed as a college bust, unfortunately. Now, there are reasons why he hasn't had a lot of playing time. He played behind Desmond Ritter for two years, Ben Bryant comes back, and Ben Bryant was a much more polished quarterback, and that's what led him to win the starting quarterback job last fall. But Evan Prater made his first two starts under not not so ideal circumstances. But then again, you got to play with the cards you're dealt with. And there are some things that Evan Prater needs to work on. He can't rely solely on his legs. He needs to be confident in throwing the ball down the field. He needs to be confident standing in the pocket, climbing the pocket. He can't just escape and expect to make plays off script every play. That's not going to happen. So, Emory Jones, I'm really excited to see what Brad Glenn and Scott Satterfield can get out of him. But keep this in mind. Emory Jones is only here for one year. He has one year of eligibility. So the focus has to also be on next year, in addition to this year. If Evan Prater still struggles this year, as he did last year. And those struggles are a talking point at the end of this season. That's not a good position to be in if you're Cincinnati. 
Because then you don't know who your starting quarterback is going to be. Ben Bryant's done after this year. Prater, Drogosh, and who knows about Brady Lichtenberg. I had someone ask me the other day who Brady Lichtenberg was. And I told him he's been here for three years and hasn't seen much playing time. Sometimes that happens. And sometimes the things that cause you to not get a lot of playing time are out of your control. Would I be shocked if Brady Lichtenberg transferred? No. But your quarterback room next year, right now, looks thin. Now, why am I looking ahead to the next year? Should I be? No. But I am saying to you, if Evan Prater doesn't take the next steps this season in his development, I'm just for I'm just forewarning you. The quarterback room next year is going to be thin, razor thin. So that's why Evan Prater and Brady Drogash too. The young guys, it's going to be really interesting to see how they learn and grow under Brad Glenn and Scott Satterfield. But Evan Prater is on what? His fourth op- I mean, he's had Mike Dembrock, Gino Gadouli, Tom Manning, Brad Glenn, Scott Satterfield. That's five guys to learn from. Drogash early in Rolly. We'll see him at spring practice next week. Excited to see how much of a factor he plays in the quarterback battle. Is he going to actually make a push to be the starting job? His development could be critical to this year and 2024. Is Brady Lichtenberg going to be in a more ideal position to get playing time? It's not a rational question to think he could, but it's also not out of the question with Brad Glenn. It really is not. Obviously, you want to see how Emory Jones fares in his system, but you also want to see the young guys, like Prater specifically. Evan Prater now has the luxury of being a part of a team that is coached, the head coach, is an offensive-minded guy. And I'm not saying Mook Fickle never took the quarterback position seriously. He even talked about, if you read Pete Thamel's uh, all-access piece on the Cincinnati Bearcats back in 2021, he reported that Luke Fickle and Desmond Ritter had a great relationship because Luke Fickle understood the relationship between quarterback and head coach. Even if... He's defensive minded. Look at what Josh Allen and Sean McDermott are doing up in Buffalo. You can win with a defensive minded head coach. Bearcats did for four years, but now there are luxuries in place. I'm not saying Luke Fickle wasn't a luxury, but Scott Satterfield being offensive minded, the Bearcats having dual threat quarterbacks and a different scheme potentially on offense. And you want to see what Emory Jones, who is the presumptive starter right now, but also the young guys, because those are the future. And you don't want them to leave, and then you're left scrambling to figure out your quarterback position in 2024. But obviously the focus is on 2023. Speaking of 2023, I think one thing that we are maybe assuming, but is it actually the best thing to happen? I'll explain after I tell you how this episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by the amazing Built Bar. Looking for a delicious treat but don't want all of the fat and calories, then you got to try a Built Bar because we just got through the holidays. Just the holidays were a long time ago. And I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year. If you're like me, where you want to eat healthier but don't want to compromise taste, then man, I've got just the thing for you. You got to try Built because with Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously. They're so delicious, you won't think they're good for you. Perfect for your New Year's resolution. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they are all covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Built does it. Well, these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. What's even better is that they are healthy. Only 130 calories and 4 grams of sugar, the whopping 17 grams of protein. And now... You don't need to wait around and get a box for years. We've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. Now, you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. And to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. If you're close to Sam's Club, run in, 
and grab a 13 bar box with our hit flavors brownie batter and churro. You can thank me later. And thanks again for making Locked On Bearcats your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place, plus name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Big night ahead in the conference tournament slate Tuesday night. Of course, you've got the first round of the Sun Belt Championship, Arkansas State and Coastal Carolina. You've got the first round of the Penn Fed Credit Union Patriot League Championship. How about that for a title? Bucknell and American. My aunt went to American University. The first uh, Holy Cross and Loyola, Maryland. The Horizon League Championship. The Bar Barbasol. Excuse me. I haven't heard of that product in years. The Barbasol Horizon League Championship. IUPUI. That's the first round. IUPUI. And Robert Morris, Green Bay and Wright State, Purdue, Fort Wayne, Detroit, Mercy. The quarterfinals, the A Sun, Liberty to playing tonight, North Alabama against Eastern Kentucky, Kennesaw State playing tonight. Both my parents went there. Lipscomb and Stetson playing tonight as well. And the first round of the Sun Belt Championship continuing later tonight, Georgia State and Texas State. How about that? At the time of this recording, the two games of the first round of the Ace Sun last night were still going on, but the two winners taking on Liberty and Kennesaw State tonight. Back to the Bearcats, of course. Cincinnati, Ben Bryant. Ben Bryant. Is Ben Bryant transferring a sure thing? Well, I, for one, think Bryant will transfer after the spring. I think he will. I think he'll test out Practice under Scott Satterfield, see where he stands, what he's able to do coming off that broken foot, realize that there are other quarterbacks who are better fit for Satterfield's system. And he'll realize it's time for him to move on. But here's the problem. Who is Ben Bryan going to want? Who is going to want Ben Bryan to start on their team? Because having him as a backup will be really nice. In case something happens to your starter, you're getting a guy who's in his sixth year of college football. And Ben Bryant has been at two different schools. He started a season's worth of college football at two different schools. If that's the reality for Bryant, if he's going to be a backup somewhere, I would want that to happen here. Why are Bryant and Prater getting more coverage than Emory Jones, you ask? Well, Emory Jones hasn't been with Cincinnati for very long. Ben Bryant's been with Ben Bryant has been associated with the Bearcats for a long time, since 2018. I mean, that goes back to when Luke Fickle was rebuilding this program. He has a lot of history with the Cincinnati Bearcats, almost synonymous with this program. His role as a backup when Desmond Ritter was here, and then a much maligned starter. That's a lot of history and a lot of coverage. And when you're the quarterback, you're going to get the most coverage. That's how, that's how this world works. But I do think you will see him test out practice under Scott Satterfield. He understands right now that he has history at Cincinnati and experience to just maybe and I don't think he's going to, just maybe win the starting quarterback job. I don't know what he's going to be able to do coming off a broken foot. He already struggled with his mobility last year. Watching him run was not the prettiest thing in the world. And there are other quarterbacks like Jones and Prater and Drogosh who are better fit for Satterfield's system. But considering what Ben Bryant has meant to this program and the games he has played in, the one thing I said last year constantly, and the one game I referred to a lot on this show, was that winner-take-all game in the regular season against Memphis in 2019. It wasn't a winner-take-all game as far as a regular season title or a championship. It was the winner of that game would host the American Championship game the following week. So it did have a lot of riding on it. Both teams were 10-1. and 1. It was the Bearcats' first time playing Memphis 
since 2016, first time under Luke Fickle. Ben Bryant started that game in place of Desmond Ritter. It was a late decision, game time decision by Luke Fickle. Ben Bryant gets the starting job. He plays admirably, but he throws two picks. But the fact that he had the Bearcats in position at the end of the game to win, Emory Jones has not played in that kind of game. Emory Jones at Florida in 2021, yeah, they played Alabama. That's not a winner-take-all game. And last year at Arizona State, Sun Devils weren't a factor in the Pac-12. So, Jones does have the experience, but Bryant has experience playing in some big-time games. You talk about the games against Arkansas and UCF, ECU last year. And I know he wasn't great in those games. Second half against Arkansas, I thought he played really well. He gave the Bearcats several chances to win that game. The point is this. You think Brian is transferring after the spring. And that probably will happen. But there is something to Ben Bryan being this team's backup quarterback. Because what if? What if something were to happen to Emory Jones? And let's say Evan Prater is still not starting quarterback ready. Or Drogash is not developed enough yet. You want those guys to go in in Big 12 games? I mean, Evan Prater is not going to be able to make his first significant appearance against a dreadful Temple team in front of 3,000 fans, you're going to be making your first appearance potentially at Pitt, at BYU, at Oklahoma State. That's not Temple. You think Oklahoma State's not going to sell out? Huh. In a perfect world, maybe they wouldn't. An ideal world for you as a Bearcats fan, I should say. So that's why having a guy like Bryant and... I'm not saying that that's a great thing. I'm saying there is some value to that. A sixth-year quarterback as your backup who did display at times last year why he was good. There were times last year, I mean, I remember the Miami game. He was completing like 17 passes in a row. I mean, if you remember the Indiana game last year in the first half, he couldn't miss downfield. So the sideline, crossed the middle, didn't matter. He was making throws. And that's why, to me, if Ben Bryan is going to be a backup, I'd rather have it happen here than somewhere else. Because there is some value to that. He is synonymous with this program. He and Prater both. They get more coverage than Jones. It's weird. The presumptive starter for Cincinnati... Is not getting as much coverage, I feel like, as Bryant and Prater. At least on this show. But that's because Prater's, you know, his the aura surrounding his recruitment and commitment, and Bryant because he's been with the Bearcats for a long time and he's played a lot for Cincinnati. In a big game in 2019, and for the first 11 games last year, he was a starter. And many of you... Or I should say some of you might still believe if he starts that game against Tulane, the Bearcats probably win. And then Luke Fickle might still be here. So it's crazy, though, and maybe weird to think about that Luke Fickle's not here, but Ben Bryan is. If he's going to be a backup, which that's probably who he's going to be, I would suspect, or I would want, rather, him to be that here, where that there could be some value to that. Coming up, should the Bearcats accept an invite to the NIT if they don't make the NCAA tournament? I'll answer that question after we hear from two of our sponsors. I'm going to tell you why the Bearcats should accept a bid of the NIT. They absolutely should, because why not? You can only gain experience from playing in the NIT. Last year, the Cincinnati Bearcats, I think, were invited to the CBI. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Someone, if you're listening to this. And Wes Miller said no. That, and he cited that the Bearcats don't play in those tournaments. They only play in the NCAA tournament. And I loved what he said at the time. But thinking about it now, 
that kind of came across as arrogant. Because right now, the Cincinnati Bearcats are not an NCAA tournament team. They are not a program that makes it to the that that is making it to the NCAA tournament. They haven't been in four years. And obviously there was a five year stretch or a six year stretch where they didn't make it. Or yeah, it was five. The 06 through 10. But there is still something to be said about playing in the NIT. It's not the NCAA tournament. I understand that. What I also understand is that you can gain experience just like Memphis in 2021 and Xavier last year. Those teams had NCAA tournament expectations. Both those teams, they didn't make it. But both teams went to the NIT and won. And it paved the way for their next seasons. Memphis made the tournament last year, nearly took down Gonzaga in the second round. Xavier is going to the tournament this season. And you think about Xavier, maybe playing in the NIT prepared them for their gauntlet of a non-conference schedule this year. Because in the NIT, you'll play some Power 5 teams who are good, that just missed the tournament. And you get to play home games. Campus site games in the round of 32, 16, and 8. And then you go off to Madison Square Garden for the NIT Final Four. Sorry again for my bad allergies. But how could you not accept an invite to the NIT? You are an improved team this year that isn't going to the NCAA tournament. That's fine. It's not maybe fine by the Bearcats standards, but you have an opportunity to play in the NIT. And look at the... The players on Memphis and Xavier who benefited from playing in that tournament. Landers Nolly the second, DeAndre Williams. I mean, Nolly's now on the Bearcats. Of course. Zach Fremantle, Adam Kunkel. And for mid-major teams, and I don't think Cincinnati's a mid-major team, playing against good power five teams can only help you. Help Xavier, like I said, prepare for their non-conference Gotham this year. And it could help Cincinnati go into the Big 12 next year. And here's the thing, by the way, about Wes Miller. He's only led two teams to the NCAA tournament in his career. And that was at UNC Greensboro. So he doesn't have a lot of coaching experience in the postseason following conference tournaments. Perhaps he could use that in the NIT. I understand last year not wanting to accept it, but you got to know your place. And this program is a good program. They could still make a run in the conference tournament and get to the NCAA tournament. But don't just not play in a postseason. I think about seniors like, I think about Jeremiah Davenport and Micah Adams-Woods. Seniors who haven't played in postseason games beyond the conference tournament. 2020, they didn't get to. 2021, they lost in the championship game. 2022, they didn't play in the postseason following the AAC tournament, and then this year, we don't know. David Julius has only played in the postseason one time, and that was his freshman season in Michigan in 2018-2019. There's a lot of guys, I mean, there's a lot of seniors on this team who have not played in a postseason game, a post season game. Why would you deprive them of that this season? I certainly would not. I want to finish today um, by congratulating the Bearcats men's track and field team. They captured the indoor conference championship Saturday inside the Birmingham complex, crossplex rather, down in Birmingham. It's the Bearcats First men's indoor conference title since 1995. How long ago was that? Well, the Bearcats were members of the great Midwest Conference. And it's their first indoor-outdoor conference title since 2004. Also congratulating uh, Riley Penn from the women's team. Women's team finished second overall uh, in the standings. Fourth straight year 
in second place. Most valuable performer in the conference championships over the weekend. She won both conference titles in the mile and 3,000 meter run. She also, on the gold medal winning women's DMR, that's distance medley relay, that broke the school record with a time of 11 minutes, 21 seconds, and 21.95 seconds. First Bearcat to win the most valuable performer since Annette Ekekonwoke did it in 2017. What a great, great athlete she was in her day at Cincinnati. She finished right as I started at Cincinnati. Back tomorrow with a, another question for you to ponder before tomorrow show. How long of a leash should you give Scott Satterfield and should the Bearcats give him heading into his first season and the Bearcats first in the Big 12 programming note? Um, I said the live room is going to be tomorrow at 12.30. That now we are not sure about with Russ Hellman working on saying in time for that. I do know this, and I should have mentioned this off the top. Um, Caroline Fenton of Lockdown LSU, she's going to join me on Thursday uh, for a little insight to how their first season went under former Bearcats coach and coach Brian Kelly. So looking forward to talking with her friend of the show on that. And then Friday, Scott Satterfield is speaking to the media Thursday at noon, ahead of spring practice, I will be there and looking forward to being there. Scott Sutterfield and select coaches will be talking to assembled members of the Bearcats media and looking forward to giving you my biggest takeaways from that press conference. Hey, thanks for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen today. For your second listen, check out our brand new podcast, Lockdown College Basketball Experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton. Bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, here from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape, Locked On College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. I'm on Twitter at Frankie underscore Nanny with two N's and an ATI Instagram, Alex Frank down underscore and email Alex 3 Frank, Alex 3 Frank at gmail.com. Again, apologies for bad allergies. I'm Alex Frank. Thanks for making Locked On Bearcats your first listen of every day. Part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Have a great last day of February, and I'll be back tomorrow on the first day of the best month of the year right here on Lockdown Bearcats.